Indonesia, home to one of the greatest and the oldest biodiversity hotspots on the planet. It's also the world's third largest tropical forest. But today, the country's critical natural resource is depleting. Between 2001 and 2017, Indonesia lost 24 million hectares of its forest cover due to massive deforestation, almost the size of the United Kingdom. These forests are the lung of our planet and vital in regulating the air climate. Uh, in fact, they are our strongest defense uh, against uh, climate change. Deforestation on the islands of Sumatra and Kalimantan alone account for almost 90% of its national forest loss. Kalau hutan itu punah semuanya, mungkin masyarakat di Kalimantan ini juga punah. In fact, Indonesia today has emerged as the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the United States. Forest degradation has also been blamed for the deadly natural disasters such as floods and landslides in recent years. We are going to reach to a point of no return. And this thing is going to be so catastrophic for the world, not just for Indonesia, but for the world. What has been done to save Indonesia's beleaguered rainforests? Or have all the efforts to stop and reverse the process of deforestation come too little, too late. Forty-year-old Alia Noor works as a coconut sugar maker in Sampit District, central Kalimantan. But he picked up this job only a few years ago. Before this, Alia Noor worked as an illegal logger. In fact, he spent the bulk of his adult life cutting trees in some of central Kalimantan's dense forests, away from the prying eyes of the authorities. He got the job through a middleman who engaged his service to harvest timber from the forests. The wood which he collected would then be transported to timber companies for further processing. The risk of being caught was high. But Alienor felt it was something worth doing. Saya jadi penabang pohon atau hutan dari sejak umur 13-14 tahun ikut bapak saya ke hutan nebang pohon dan resikonya sangat besar sekali itu resikonya tantangan sama polisi dan kehutanan saya menebang pohon dari hutan dengan jarak sekitar dua jam lebih saya masuk hutan dan di dalam hutan itu cukup sepi ada kicauan burung aja enggak ada Gumpul sama anak istri dan keluarga yang di rumah. Saya dalam jangka satu bulan itu masuk hutan. Kadang-kadang saya ada teman, kadang-kadang saya sendirian dan resikonya itu cukup besar. According to Aliano, without a good education, that's the only thing he could do to survive and feed his family. To him and numerous other poor people like him, who worked as illegal loggers is just a way of making a quick buck. Saya dulu memang kayak gitu. Yang pertama saya pendidikan enggak ada. Saya cuma sekolahnya SD aja. Ya, setelah SD saya langsung berusaha untuk bantu orang tua saya masuk dalam hutan nabang kayu tadi. Ya, enggak 50 potong. Satu pohon itu sekitar 2 atau 3 potong. Potong kayu yang panjang 4 4 meter itu. Kalau saya kerja dari jam setengah enam sampai jam empat sore. Istirahatnya jam sebelas sampai jam satu siang. Jam setengah enam sampai jam sebelas istirahat saya. Makan siang. Jam satu kerja lagi sampai jam empat. 
itu dijual pakai kubik sekitar 8 kubik satu bulan itu dan hasilnya sekitar 8 jutaan juga According to Indonesia's Forestry Ministry before 2010 the country lost 1.6 to 2.8 million hectares of forests annually and former loggers like Aliano also had a small part to play in contributing to the loss of Indonesia's natural heritage. But only today that he realizes the devastation and the environmental damage caused by massive deforestation. He recently watched in horror at an unfolding disaster as massive floods swamped several parts of the neighboring province of South Kalimantan. Kalau Kalimantan Selatan banjir yang kayak kayak di sini Paman sama sepupunya istri saya itu banyak. Dia di Kalimantan Selatan di daerah timurnya. Kayaknya dia kirim WA ke saya itu rumahnya yang lantai ini di dalam air semua. In January this year, on the Indonesian side of Borneo Island, more than 20 people perished and over 250,000 were displaced after massive floods inundated South Kalimantan. It was the worst flooding in 50 years. A state of emergency was declared in the province to help mobilize relief and rescue operations in the affected regions. According to the government, the massive flooding was caused by the worst rainfall in over a decade. However, environmentalists and local residents say widespread deforestation for oil palm plantations and unbridled mining operations were responsible for the country's ecological disaster. There are several disasters happen in Indonesia and then it's not because only the, the weather, it's because of the forest not uh, protecting properly. Uh, the biggest uh, flooded at the moment in many place in Indonesia, in Kalimantan, in Java, in, in Celebes, and, and also in, 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 in Papua at the moment is because uh, the forest is not protected. And then in other part, when the dry season, we can see how many areas also burn because of the forest and peatland is not protected. If you look at the, you know, the issue of deforestation and climate change, it really affects everybody. You start seeing drought that is longer and longer, and it happened more frequent. And these things, we are reaching to a tipping point where it's so dangerous that if we don't protect what we have, particularly, you know, forests. Indonesia is home to the world's third largest tropical forest after Brazil and the Congo Basin. Peat forests in Indonesia act like a giant sponge which store water and absorb carbon dioxide, a key greenhouse gas which heats up the planet and drives global climate change. The forests release the carbon to the atmosphere whenever trees are cut down or burned. In 1990, natural forests covered around 130 million hectares of land across Indonesia. By 2019, the number of forest cover had fallen to around 88 million hectares. That means Indonesia has lost a staggering 25 million hectares of forest in nearly 30 years. From our analysis coming from Minister of Forestry data, the deforestation from 2001 until 2019, it's about 9.6 million hectares. And then from 9.6 million hectare deforestation, 2.7 uh, million hectare in palm oil concession, 1.7 million hectare in uh, uh, HTI, HTI is a uh, uh, pop and paper uh, plantation, and then 900,000 uh, hectare in logging concession. 
So at least 5.4 million hectare or 55.8% deforestation in those three concession types. If you look at the global map, Indonesia's remaining rainforests are among the largest in the world, next to the Amazon. And we know that the last two years have seen severe fires across the world. Besides the rainforest, which people pay a lot of attention to, there's other kind of very special biosphere called peatlands, which Indonesia has some of the deepest and largest peatlands in the world. And these are huge carbon sink. If they're treated well, they can help absorb and contain the climate change problem. But if they go badly, if they're developed wrongly or overdeveloped, this will release fires, haze, and carbon much worse than any normal land or uh, 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 forest fire. The last large-scale forest fires in Indonesia happened in 2015. According to the World Bank, more than 2.6 million hectares of forest were destroyed by fires in 2015, an area nearly five times the size of Bali. The forest fires have resulted in losses and damages amounting to more than 16 billion US dollars. Acrid smoke from the fires engulfed neighboring Malaysia and Singapore and reached as far as southern Thailand. Air quality near some of the most intense peatland fires regularly exceeded the maximum level of 1,000 on the International Pollutant Standard Index. It was more than three times the amount considered hazardous. If you have this uh, unregulated practices, then you have you know, this annual uh, haze, forest fires from Indonesia. So, and the, the impact is, is quite considerable. I think when it comes to numbers, uh, you're talking about, you know, in, in thousands, uh, in billions of dollars. The World Bank in 2015 actually talked about agriculture and forestry losses as a result of forest fires totaling to about 13.4, 13 billion US dollars. The disaster prompted President Joko Widodo to set up the Peat Restoration Agency, or BRG, in 2015. Its main role is to re-wet the most vulnerable peatland, which covered more than 2 million hectares. I always credit that Pat Jokowi, within his first year, was the first Indonesian president to go to the areas affected by the fires while the fires were going on. That year, some Indonesian children died from the haze. And Pachukui, as the first non-elite man from the, from the grassroots coming up, I think he had a very uh, empathy, sympathy for this situation. So the laws he has made, the creation of the BRG as a new agency to take care of the peatlands, I think you can really see there has been an effort. And he's also used it for his political legacy, right? He's talked about how in his re-election campaign, how trying to stop the fires and haze was part of his promise and delivery for the Indonesian people, not for the rest of the world. A lot of things they have been doing, but not enough to solve all of the problem. Because from the beginning, I don't believe that they were able to restore of 2 million hectares. 2 million hectares is a lot. Eh? It's a lot eh? You have to do, uh, and what I calculated, almost uh, 100 or more than 100 hectares every day. Eh? So there's a lot of things uh, you have to do. Um, but to be fair, as, uh, as I mentioned, they, they do, they did a good things and several things, but still need to improve. Despite all the efforts, land clearing method, which have been blamed for out of control fire and smoke, are still happening in Indonesia. In 2019, more than 942,000 hectares of forests and lands were burned, the biggest since the fires in 2015, according to official figures. In fact, Indonesia is losing large hectares of forest every year. Just as you know, the uh, deforestation is still happening. It's uh, 0.4 million hectares happening now, every year. 0.4 still. So this is a uh, things we need to improve. 
if I mention government on the right track, yes, is the direction is 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 good, but uh, their capacity, their budget, their effort, and also corruption still everywhere. So this is like a, a bad leg between a good side and bad side. When will the burning stop? What does it take to put an end to the forest fires? once and for all. Fifty-two-year-old Munia lost her sister when massive fires ravaged much of Indonesia's forests in central Kalimantan six years ago. The rubber farmer still remembers vividly the chaos that ensued and the pain caused by the disaster in Sunpit district where she lives. People were gasping for air and visibility was reduced to less than five meters as smoky haze from burning forest fires blanketed the village and the surrounding regions. Keluarga saya memang jauh dari perkebunan tapi asap sudah meluas kan. Kebetulan Mungkin juga itu memang sudah hasilnya saudara saya meninggal. Karena memang dia sakit, tapi pada saat ini kan ispa oleh karena ada asap itu tadi. Kebakaran dari 2015 itu, sungai aja dilewati sama api. Sungai, dia lompat. Saking besarnya kebakaran itu, itu kita lihat sendiri. Ya Allah, ini udah di sungai, kita di sini muka jalan ya, di sana. Terus lompat dia, nyebrang sungai, itu api. Bagaimana mungkin e, bara akelatu kelatunya itu kan terbang karena kepanasan terlalu panas kan ini langsung jadi di sana udah lebar lagi jadi masyarakat itu tidak mampu untuk menghadapi seperti itu apalagi yang wilayahnya penduduknya yang di sekitar hutan itu yang terbakar dikelilingi lah mereka sudah ingin menyelamatkan jiwa dulu kan apalagi kebun kebun ya kalau bisa diselamatkan ya mereka selamatkan. Murnia, a mother of one, co-owns 30 hectares of rubber plantation together with her relatives. The fires in 2015 destroyed 17 hectares of rubber trees. The economic impact of her family was devastating. They lost hundreds of millions of rupiah and it took years for the trees to grow again. Rasanya gimana ya? Masyarakat juga bisa merasakan gimana itu sangat dampak sekali dengan kita, terutama kebun kita, kita biaya yang biapa yang kita keluarkan sudah banyak habis, tapi karena kan itu ada alam. Nah, dengan itu kita harus sadar, masyarakat kita harus sadar, dengan ada kebakaran itu kita harus jaga hutan kita. Dan juga yang sangat simpati sekali kayak karena ada kebakaran itu kasihan hewan-hewan yang ada di hutan itu, terutama pernah satu kali itu. Hmm, orang hutan mereka pada turun kan mencari makanan 2015 ini kan penuh yang seperti ini kan penuh penghijau kan tapi setelah kebakaran udah jadi lapangan jadi lapangan udah nggak kelihatan lagi udah udah ini rata lah, habis semua The fires that burn in the carbon-rich and highly combustible peatlands occurred not only in Kalimantan, but in Sumatra as well. Millions of people across Southeast Asia were exposed to the toxic haze. The worst haze hit Indonesia in 1997-1998 when drought caused by El Nino sparked fires across the country. The choking smoke spread to Singapore, Malaysia and southern Thailand, costing the region more than 9 billion US dollars in damages to tourism, transport and farming. The disaster also coincided with Indonesia's economic and political upheaval, which led to the downfall of President Suharto in 1998. Suharto's move to clear one million hectares of peatland in central Kalimantan in 1996 to grow rice also backfired. 
lot of uncertainty in the uh, politics and law enforcement. So to me, the combination between uh, El Nino, the dry, very dry season, also the turmoil of the uh, the politics, uh, to uh, the law enforcement is very very low. The uh, people is very upset with the Suharto. So um, this is the combination produce uh, huge fires eight on eight million hectare, right? but particularly in Burundi at that time. Because Paharto was so convinced that he wants to basically have a food security on rice, so he decided to open that one million hectares. But what we learned over time, because of that opening, it created all the fire and haste that is ongoing until today. Then you move fast forward 2015. Some of this is actually the fact due to a lot of the opening that is happening even 10 years, you know, between 1997 to 2005, all these things. Because once you open peatland, it's very hard to restore. And even if the peatlands are cleared and drained for agriculture, the tinder dry lands will become highly flammable, especially during the dry season. Unlike typical forests, which what we call a dry forest, peatland stored a lot of carbon. You know, it's stored below ground because these were dead woods and basically organic matters that is still on the soil. Hence, uh, you know, when you want to cultivate peatland, meaning convert it into other usage, you have to drain them. You know, well, intact peatland is always wet. While you drain them by opening canal, suddenly this thing becomes dry on the dry season, it becomes a tinderbox and it's so easily caught fire. The creation of the special agency to restore peatland and mangroves has offered some hope, but weak law enforcement and a lack of awareness among many Indonesians about the potential caused by degraded peatlands have made it harder to enforce such measures. Saya mengatakan malah kalau bukan 100%, 99,9% itu akibat ulah manusia, bukan ulah iklim. Ya. Jadi uh, El Nino itu nggak bawa korek api terus membakar hutan. Jadi pesannya uh, Kondisi itu iya, misalnya fenomena alam iklim cuaca itu, terutama kita mengenal pada saat El Nino, itu kondisi memang menjadi kering. Kondisi lingkungan menjadi kering, termasuk termasuk hutan itu menjadi kering, semuanya menjadi kering. Dan itu kan kalau kondisi kering itu mudah sekali, ya mudah sekali terbakar, terbakar, dibakar itu mudah mudah sekali ya. Jadi itu yang sebenarnya bukan lalu El Nino nya lalu kebakaran, tapi ada penyebab penyebabnya kebakaran itu. The other challenging the protecting in forest besides the zoning of forest, transparency of the data, the other one is about related to it the uh, law enforcement. So it's it's really it's really weak on the uh, uh, law enforcement. The companies or the people who doing the deforestation or doing the burning the fire, the fire, the, the forest, uh, it's really rare and very little who get the strong sanction. Many people, including Munia, are still traumatized by the tragic events of 2015. She can only hope that forest fires of such a scale will not happen in her own backyard ever again, as it would destroy everything which she has painstakingly built for many years. Harapan saya semoga kebakaran-kebakaran yang selama ini yang kita lihat, yang pernah kita lakukan, kita berdoa jangan sampai lagi ada, dan kita harus waspada dan harus berhati-hati. Kita berjagalah, bukan saya sendiri, semua seluruh masyarakat supaya sadar yang terjadi yang pada tahun 2015 yang itu yang besar-besaran. Wong kita harus waspada dan hati-hati dan menjaga. Just over 2 decades ago 
This area in Indonesia's central Kalimantan region was covered by lush forests. Today, the vast primordial canopy of dense rainforest has been replaced by oil palm plantations that stretch as far as the eye can see. Millions of hectares of forests have been cleared, particularly in Kalimantan and the neighboring island of Sumatra. Indonesia is now the world's biggest producer of palm oil, accounting for 85 to 90 percent of the global palm oil production. It's also a top exporter of pulp and paper, as well as coal. But this rush to cash in on the growing demand for such products has had a huge impact on people's lives, their health and the environment. The vast province of central Kalimantan was the scene of some of the country's most devastating forest fires six years ago. And just in July last year, a state of emergency was declared after 700 hotspots were detected in the province. Forty-year-old native of the province, Alia Nur, was once an illegal logger, but he has now turned over a new leaf. Just three years ago, he decided to take the job of a coconut sugar maker instead. He's able to earn around 4 million rupiah, or 280 US dollars a month, even during the pandemic period. That's because the demand for coconut sugar, which is used in cooking and baking, has remained quite strong in spite of the current health crisis. That has provided him with an important source of income for him and his family. Ya, kumpul sama keluarga dan nggak terpisah sama anak istri. Uh, bisa tidur sama-sama, makan sama-sama. Kalau dalam hutan nggak bisa saya. <laughs> Habis waktu dalam hutan aja. Saya pernah ditangkap polisi dua kali saya. Bayar saya. Kalau nggak saya bayar, saya bisa di penjara dong. <laughs> Sekitar 500 ribu aja satu kali tangkap. Hasil saya 2 juta, potong lagi 500, belum lagi untuk buat, buat belanja, saya bayar-bayar hutang di tempat-tempat warung-warung. Habis dong. Alia Noor is among dozens of local people who have been trained by a private company, Rimba Makmo Utama, to source out alternative employments instead of relying on the region's forest resources to earn a living. The company, which was founded in 2007, manages the Kantingan Mentaya project in central Kalimantan. It is spread across a concession area in tropical peat swamp forests more than twice the size of Singapore. The company also trains locals to put out forest fires and look out for potential threats, especially during the dry season. This is one way of protecting and preserving the forests and their ecosystems against wildfires. Katingan Mentaya project is a never to protect and restore peatland forests in central Kalimantan. The size is about 157,000 hectares, which is equivalent to two and a half times the size of the island of Singapore. The idea is that we can actually still protect the last remaining peatland forests in Indonesia, provide sustainable livelihood for the communities, and finally make profit for the companies. The endeavor took us now, this is our 13 years. We finally can say that we have actually reduced 30 million tons of carbon credit in the air without our intervention, those 30 million tons credit, you know, carbon credit, oh, I'm sorry, those 30 million tons of emission will happen. We also can prove that we have been working closely with 30 more villages where we can, we provide better livelihood for them, better education, better health. And of course, this is still a process. You know, this is, I think we still have a long way to go. The Kantingan Mantaya project is part of a UN-backed program called Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation, or better known as REDD+. And it comes in the form of a climate financing scheme to help and encourage developing countries 
keep their forests intact, especially in carbon-rich peatlands in Indonesia. And in return for saving the forests, these countries will be rewarded with carbon credit payments from businesses like Volkswagen and Shell to help them achieve their own climate goals. I think last year has been a good year for us. You know, I think uh, we, we still continue, the clients that we serve continue to buy credit from us. So Volkswagen, for example, and Shell, we have more and more clients. I think more and more customer understand the value of protecting nature now. I think, you know, I think that, of course, we still have a long way to go. The estimated value of forest carbon credits is between five and 10 US dollars each. Each offset represents a ton of carbon which is locked away by the forest instead of allowing it to be released into the atmosphere. 55-year-old Alian Shah was also trained by the company to adopt alternative methods of clearing land so as to minimize the incidence of forest fires. In the past, he used the slash and burn technique to open up land for cultivation. Such traditional practice is seen as one of the leading causes of forest fires and deforestation in Indonesia. But the successful citrus farmer no longer resorts to the slash and burn technique to clear his lands. Kalau dulu memang saya membakar, tapi kalau sekarang enggak lagi. Ya sekitar lima tahunan lah saya enggak membakar. Kita buka lahan ini enggak membakar. Kalau dibakar kan cepat. Satu jam, dua hektar, tiga hektar kan habis semua. Kalau keunggulannya kalau dibakar. Kalau kadar dibakar itu, itulah lama. Kalau dibakar itu kan apa? Bilang orang di sini tuh pupuknya banyak. Tapi satu kali aja bu. Kalau pakai organik ini tetap bagus semua. Itulah keunggulannya. Kalau dibakar memang pertama tumbuh itu bu bagus. Tapi sudah satu kali, dua kali itu nggak bisa lagi. Harus dibakar lagi bu. Nah itulah dulu itu. Sering membakar, sering membakar apa? Kita membuka lahan kan kalau nggak dibakar nggak bisa bagus lagi itu pak kalau padi. Nah itulah alasannya dulu tuh kan. Kalau sekarang kita sudah tahu, pertama tahu itu cara caranya kan kita tahu semua. Oh membakar itu nggak bisa. Pertama itu merusak lingkungan juga, bilang-bilang orang-orang itu kan, ya, bilang saya itu bagus. Saya mendukung, bilang saya. Under the 2015 Paris Agreement to curb global warming, Indonesia is committed to slash its emissions by 29% by the year 2030. It could raise the target to 41% with international support. Everybody have to contribute. Hence, Katingan Mentai project can invite the private sectors because there is a business of protecting nature now. You know, this doesn't belong to just an NGO, doesn't belong to just the donor money, but there is a business that doing good, that make money. Hence, I think, uh, you know, we are in that moment. Even the government right now is looking to have a regulation on how to create this, how to build this ecosystem where private sectors, communities, even NGO can actually be compensated if they protect and restore forests. Indonesia is, by the UN estimates, one of the largest emitters of carbon. A lot of it is from the land and deforestation and degradation. And, and if we see Indonesia begin to industrialize the emissions and use more energy, that number will just go up and up. So. If you want to grow your industry, you must use the land you already have and develop it in a more productive way and a more sustainable way. So this is the critical juncture where the industry should not become a devil to all of us, but they must be nudged, encouraged and also pushed to become more sustainable. The question is, will Indonesia be able to act fast enough to meet a large share of its commitments to reduce carbon emissions. Will it be able 
to stop further degradation of its tropical forests and prevent another environmental calamity before the next dry season comes. In the westernmost province of Aceh and Sumatra, at a district called Janto, a group of young men is hard at work planting trees and clearing bushes and shrubs. Their key mission is to turn these five hectares of degraded land adjacent to Aceh's remaining pristine forest into lush forests once again. Inspired from a unique Islamic concept called waqf, or charitable endowment, they have been working tirelessly to raise funds for the project. The money collected will then be used to buy over degraded lands, or lands which have been destroyed by forest fires. And new trees will be planted on these lands, which they have acquired to help restore the forests. Di samping melindungi sumber daya air untuk erosi, pencegahan erosi, juga untuk koridor satwa. Jadi inisiatif ini sangat penting karena cocok sekali dengan untuk mitigasi perubahan iklim yang saat ini sedang terjadi. Jadi unisi, ini, hutan wakaf ini adalah salah satunya adalah memitigasi. Kita menanam pohon, kita memelihara pohon di sini dan kita uh, meluaskan terus hutan wakaf ini. Bagaimana hutan wakaf ini turut berpartisipasi dengan planet bumi untuk menyelamatkan planet bumi dari perubahan iklim yang saat ini sedang terjadi. More than two thirds of the world's population believe climate change has pushed the Earth to its dangerous tipping point, beyond which the impact would be disastrous and irreversible. Urgent action is therefore needed to prevent another catastrophe of a monumental proportion. Yang kita lakukan yang pertama untuk melakukan upaya penurunan emisi itu adalah kita harus menurunkan tingkat deforestasi kita. Yang selama ini satu setengah sampai satu juta, target kita tahun 2030 itu hanya 250 ribu hektar saja. Sekarang sudah 400, jadi turunnya sudah sangat tajam sekali. Upayanya luar biasa, penegakan hukum terutama, karhutla terutama yang kita tekankan di sana. Kemudian kita juga melakukan yang namanya rehabilitasi lahan. Targetnya 12 juta hektar sampai 2030. Artinya tiap tahun kita harus merehabilitasi hutan kita seluas 800 ribu hektar. Dan dengan dana uh, uh, APBN dan dari uh, dukungan uh, internasional tentunya. Kemudian kita harus melakukan uh, pemulihan restorasi gambut seluas uh, 2 juta hektar. Sampai 2030. But some analysts feel the lack of clear policy directions may hamper the progress towards preserving and restoring the forests, especially when economic interests take precedence over environmental concerns. One point, Indonesia have several action, uh, a good action on tackling the climate change, but the other side, Indonesia also doing the opposite like passing the uh, omnibus law, like the transparency is still bad. So Indonesia mentioned that we need to grow Indonesia for the development. We need to develop the, the infrastructure and then we need to open for investment. That's why in Papua at the moment, they develop the Trans Papua who opening the forest from many parts. And then it's a really, really big uh, threat for uh, Papuan forest, who at the moment is the last frontier forest in Indonesia. Of course, when there is conflict between business interest and that of the government, and if one is, is stronger than the other, then, you know, that it becomes... Um, it becomes ineffective. And you hear that, um, you hear um, criticisms about uh, some business interests being favored by the government. Um, and so there's a tension, right? It appears there's still a lot more that needs to be done 
to tackle deforestation and forest degradation in Indonesia. But the government remains committed in its efforts to reduce the rate of its primary forest loss through effective monitoring and reporting of illegal activities. Sekarang kita mudah sekali mengetahui areal mana yang terdampak illegal logging itu. Dengan sistem informasi uh, data spasial KLHK, kita akan mudah melihat daerah-daerah mana yang ada illegal logging itu. Kita langsung bisa mengetahui koordinatnya. Kita bisa mengasung, uh, men uh, mengirimkan tim gakum kita ke lokasi itu. Sehingga semakin mudah kita mengawasi areal-areal kawasan hutan kita itu. Dari situ, perusahaan-perusahaan besar sekarang sudah tidak bisa main-main lagi karena sanksinya akan sangat berat ya sanksi administratif bisa juga sanksi pidana itu sehingga upaya-upaya itu sejak awal kita sejak dini kita lakukan dari citra satelit kemudian kira kita kirim tim kemudian kita lakukan penyelidikan di lapangan saat itu juga kita bisa mengetahui berapa luas yang terdampak illegal logging, berapa uh, kayu yang uh, terdampak dari sana, kita bisa langsung menghitung kerugiannya itu. Just three years ago, Indonesia launched an integrated map policy to help resolve overlapping claims in the vast archipelago. The idea is to put accurate information on land concessions so as to reduce the chances of dispute over the issue of permits for forest conservation, plantation and mining. It would also help resolve the long-standing problem of illegal plantations. But the one-map policy process has been largely closed off from the public and only selected government officials can have access to the portal. So, some critics argue that instead of offering more clarity about land use, it has created more confusion. Until now, we don't know. Public don't know what is the progress of one map uh, policy. We don't know. We don't know where is the uh, coal mining concession, or where is the uh, overlapping with the palm oil concession, and then where is the community area? Uh, because uh, there, there, there are also a lot of conflict in the field because uh, community area, uh, especially coming from indigenous people. Uh, they already uh, take by by companies, and then one of the transparency data is supposed supposed to be uh, resolved by this government, but at the moment it's still far from that. The second one is because also until now uh, there is not clear the direction coming from the uh, government, especially coming from the. Uh, uh, the coordination ministry who need to make sure that when they see there is a lot of overlapping, there is a conflict, they need to be resolved that. But it's not really clear on that. The challenge for all of us looking at the issue from outside is the lack of transparency. The government of Indonesia until today has not released its concession maps. Now, they treat it as a state secret. I, I guess I must respect that. But I, I want to say that until that becomes clearer, it is very difficult to really understand uh, what is the root of the problem. Finding the root of the problem has become more urgent now than ever before because of the growing threat from climate change. According to the Indonesia National Board for Disaster Management Agency, there were 185 natural disasters in Indonesia in the first three weeks of 2021 alone, mostly in the forms of floods and landslides. And the problem is expected to get worse if deforestation continues unresolved. Dan trennya ke depannya, kita akan melihat bahwa uh, Tadi saya sebutkan frekuensi ekstrim itu akan semakin tinggi dengan intensitas yang semakin kerap terjadi. Artinya kalau pada saat musim penghujan, dia akan semakin ekstrim banyak hujan. Dan sebaliknya pada saat musim kemarau di suatu tempat, dia akan semakin ekstrim kering. Nah inilah yang harus kita ambil eh, apa namanya pesan dari perubahan iklim ini, tren ke depan akan seperti itu maka kita uh, mengenal upaya adaptasi.
Jadi bagaimana kita menyesuaikan uh, terhadap kondisi yang akan berubah seperti itu. Indonesia may have taken important steps to address forest fires and now climate change. But despite its moratorium on clearing of forests, peatlands for plantations or logging activities, the lack of monitoring, especially during the pandemic, may pose a serious challenge in ensuring that the established laws won't be breached. Even at the moment, people cannot go anywhere, but uh, the, the companies still operate in the ground. And then uh, it's also the problem. Another problem is because also, I mean, that uh, a, a public cannot uh, monitoring uh, this uh, uh, in the ground. So on top of travel uh, restriction, uh, social distancing, uh, there is a, a, a budget cut have hampered this uh, year for for uh, uh, government monitoring also. So yeah, uh, there, there, there is a lot of uh, lack actually. Uh, uh, we uh, look at the, uh, the, the monitoring of our forest is really, uh, is really uh, weak at the moment because uh, government also increasing the, the decreasing the budget uh, for monitoring the illegal uh, illegal land clearance. But others are more optimistic that all the good efforts which have been put in place will bear dividends one day. I believe we are on the right track. When we talk about the end results, we still have to wait because we have commitments. Indonesia has commitments uh, like other countries it's stated in what's called a nationally determined contributions. What is the country going to do to address climate change? And of course, in addressing climate change, we have to talk about mitigation, how we reduce the carbon emissions causing climate change. And the most important thing for developing countries is the adaptation process on how we adjust so that we will be affected too much by the impact of the climate crisis. Indonesia has lost at least a quarter of its forests in the last 25 years due to rapid conversion of its forests into industrial plantations. Deforestation has now pushed the country into the top tier emitters of global greenhouse gas emissions alongside the United States and China. Although Indonesia has made strong progress in reducing deforestation in recent years, its ambitious biofuel program may erase all the gains it has made thus far. More tropical forests will have to be cleared to make way for oil palm plantations to produce biofuels. And with replanting program consistently falling short of its targets, it remains unclear if all its preservation efforts will go far enough to protect the remaining forests in the vast tropical archipelago.